good things happen when we pray, especially when we add fasting to it. And as we continue our quarterly fast on August 17, 18, and the 19th, we're going to do it differently because now we have a new facility and we're so grateful to the Lord for what He has provided. And I'm sure you have things in your life that you're grateful for. So we encourage you to register at isjack.art. That way we know how many people will come in person on Friday, uh, August 19th at 7 p.m. when we break the fast in person. And also that way we get to be able to send you the prayer points and the Bible verses. God bless you as we fast together. Welcome, IES. It's great to be with you today to worship the Lord and to celebrate Indonesia. It's our week of Tujublas Augustus, and we are excited to celebrate this nation in which we live. Some of us are guests, some of us are citizens, but we all value the opportunity that we have to be here and to worship the Lord together. And today's Q&A Sunday as well. So an opportunity for you to ask questions and see what God is speaking to us as a church, and how he would respond to those questions through the Word and through Pastor Dave. So we're excited to worship together, and we pray that God will have his way with each of us. Let's pray just like that and have God have his way. Lord, we thank you for this very special day where we worship you. It comes every week, and we gather here online, and we celebrate you. We pray also that as we celebrate you, Lord, as we worship you, our hearts are open to hear from you. And as we are asking questions today and hearing answers, I pray you would speak to our hearts about who we are to be as your people and how we respond to the world around us. And Lord, we pray that you will be glorified in all that takes place today as you are glorified in this great nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Ah, yes, so good to have you with us. And with this song, you don't want to sit down. So let's stand on our feet and worship the Lord. Thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness. Find what you're looking for For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live forever Oh 
all your failures Bring your addictions Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there With open arms See his open arms For God so loved The word that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in him Will live forever Now it is well I'm walking in freedom For God so love God so love the world Praise God Praise God From whom all blessings flow Praise Him Praise Him For the one Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love, His amazing love. For God so loved the world that He gave us, His one Bring your addictions Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world Amen God so loved the world That he gave his only son To die for you and me That's why Lord we give thanks to you every day Hallelujah we give thanks for your faithfulness Amazing Lord, how far we have come We're grateful for all you have done for us time and again Year after year the miracles Great and small true many to count your timely provisions have come through again and again we want to say thank you Lord thank you for such and
could say to him, You are good, good God, always good to us. Yes, you are good, good God, in every way, every day. Yes, you are good. Teddy, I knew Christ when I was 47. I am very thankful for many things ever since I was saved. But today, I'm most thankful for being able to deal with my temptations in my daily life. I've been dealing with temptations from my previous life, but God has given me the grace to deal with my temptations every day. That's why I'm very thankful to God that I can live a life full of grace that God has given me to deal with all my temptations. I know some of you are facing the same temptations from your previous life, but I assure you, God will give you the grace also to deal with all your temptations. That's why I'm so thankful today that I can live a life worthy of God's grace. When we come together to worship, we don't leave our week behind, our families behind, and all the circumstances of life behind. We usually bring them with us, and we want to worship God and hear from Him, but often it's heavy on our hearts. So we know that when we gather together, whether it's in person or here online, we know that there are people who need prayer. And if you have an unspoken prayer request, maybe you're not able to share it with someone to pray with you specifically. We want to pray with you nonetheless. God told us to gather together, and when we do, to pray for one another. So if you would click on the unspoken prayer request button down there on the side, if you're in the online church format, we want to pray for you. If you're watching on YouTube, maybe you can still put a message in the, in the text there, and someone will pray for you. But we want to pray for you. We also want to pray for this great nation as we celebrate independence from the colonial oppressors and as we celebrate the future of a nation that is growing and beginning to thrive and take its place on the world stage. And we want to pray for you that God would work through you to bless this nation. And we also want to pray prayers of thanksgiving because we know that this is our special month of thanksgiving. We thank God for the blessing of being able to be worshiping him together, to be worshiping him here in our new facility, 
and for those of you online to be able to be free to worship. We want to thank God for the freedom that we have in him to be set free from sin, to not be held down by temptation, but to be able to overcome it by his strength. So we want to pray and ask God to do all these things, and we want to thank him for the things he has already done. As a congregation together, let's approach God confidently because he loves us. And let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to live and serve you in this great nation of Indonesia. More than 200 million people, 700 plus language groups, many cultures, all a vast variety of people, and yet united together in one nation. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless this nation, that you would continue to build this nation and strengthen this nation, that you would develop good leadership, continue to bring good leaders to the fore so that this nation can be blessed. And we pray, Lord, for your church to grow and your church to minister to the needs of their neighbors, not just to Christians, but to everyone, so that we can share God's love to anyone who would be in need. And may you be glorified. Use us as IES to share your grace and compassion and mercy on the world around, and especially on this great nation where many people are still needing to grow and be lifted up. Help us to be a part of that, Lord, and help us to be a blessing. Lord, we thank you for the work that you do in our lives. We thank you for the stories we hear again and again of lives transformed, people renewed, hope brought to people because they have come to know you through your church. And we pray, Lord God, that you would be glorified. We celebrate you, Lord, for freeing us from sin, for lifting us from the darkness and the mud and the disgust of the things of the past, and setting us free to walk to you, to pursue you, and to see your purposes fulfilled in our lives. People who at one point were not even possible to be known as your people, and now you have adopted us and made us your people. You have raised us up and set us on a rock, a firm foundation, We trust in you, hope in you, and thank you for the grace and mercy you've given us. We pray that you would send us forward in your strength to accomplish your great work in this great nation and in the world abroad. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Hi, everyone. Uh, My name's Rick Fisher, and I've been coming to IES for over 22 years. Um, And over those years, I have a lot of things to be thankful about. I'm very thankful for uh, being part of IES in in many different ways and the role it's played in my life. Uh, Although I grew up in a Christian household, I was not an active Christian. And uh, IES really gave me the opportunity to grow and and serve uh, and to know the Lord. Um, So all these years, uh, there have been so many things that I can look to that I've been thankful for. I've been thankful for uh, my IES family, whether I was living in Indonesia or not. Uh, I always had time to be close with uh, many of the people come visit and spend time. My, my three children were all um, blessed uh, by the church and, and dedicated at, at IES. Uh, I'm thankful for my uh, amazing, beautiful children who have grown to be um, young adults that know the Lord and serve uh, with a kind and caring heart. So uh, I'm thankful that I've had so many opportunities from uh, traveling and uh, spending time with with friends and family. Uh, Work has always been a rewarding thing for me, and I'm very thankful for all of these things. But most of all, I am thankful for my amazing and beautiful wife. She has been uh, an inspiration to me. 
She is the one that first brought me to IES and, and gave me uh, the opportunity to, to grow in, in my faith. Uh, she has always been a faithful and, and humble servant. And she is just an absolute blessing to everyone around her, to her friends, uh, to her family, uh, and especially to me. And it's not often um, that you get an opportunity to share in this sort of situation how important a relationship like that is to me. Um, and I am really grateful to be able to, to just recognize my wife and, and the joy that she has brought to me. I'm so thankful for having her in my life. Uh, to me, it's a reminder that we should make sure we say these things to those people. Make sure that the people around us know that we are thankful for them and what they do for us. That is what I am thankful for. Welcome to our online service. And for those of you who might be watching this uh, on uh, First Media, uh, welcome to our service as well. I just want to say that uh, if, the, if you asked a question that doesn't actually get answered during this particular segment, you can go to the IES YouTube um, channel and you can watch. And I'm going to record answers to all the questions that I got. I got, a, I think, 48 different questions that came in. And so uh, I'm going to be able to answer all of them. But we're going to have to cut down what's going to be shown. So... Uh, for those of you who are watching, it's great to have you here. This is a weekend in our Thanksgiving month, and we're also very thankful that we are celebrating and praying for Indonesia as we come to Tujublas Augustus. Uh, we want to we want to just have prayer for the country of Indonesia that God will continue to watch over. So uh, we're going to go forward and we're going to begin to answer all of these questions. So let's prepare to answer all the questions. Let's pray, Father. I pray that in the discussion of the questions, in the questions that are asked in my answer, Lord, and in the communication in between, the understanding of what I've said, uh, perhaps, Lord, you can protect us from misunderstandings. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would prepare people's hearts and that they would be ministered to by each situation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to answer some questions here. Okay, question number one. What does submitting to your husband supposed to look like for modern day Christians? It seems that every denomination and culture has a different idea. That's true. Every denomination, every culture, probably every family has a different idea. And uh, all their ideas except mine are wrong. So let me tell you how this works. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 is when we get that long passage that talks about husbands and wives and their relationship. And for much of the church, that's a concentration that they have. However, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then it goes on to launch into this husbands and wives relationship, okay? This is really important. Now, people argue about where the, where the sentence is supposed to end, where the paragraph and all that stuff. That's not the way the Greek language works. But it is very clear from the Greek grammar, and you can look this up if you want, that when it says in verse 21, submit one to another out of reverence for Christ, the very next words are in reference to that verse 21. So husbands submit themselves to their wives by loving them and by subjugating the preference that they have to do things a certain way so that their wife feels loved, like Christ dying for the church. And wives uh, submit to their husband by allowing their husband to make the decisions. Now, you may say, well, Pastor Dave, that's not really fair. No, it, it's not really fair. And fairness doesn't have anything to do with marriage, okay? There's two people to marriage. And if you both agree, it's wonderful. And most of the time you should strive to agree. But if you disagree, there has to be a decision made. And there could be a lot of different things that the Bible could have said. Husbands, uh, if you're older than your wife, you get to make the decision or whoever's taller or, you know, all those things. But the, the Bible just simply says the decision-making ability goes to the husband. The wife uh, lets her husband make those decisions out of reverence for Christ, not because he's right, but out of reverence for Christ. Now, let me remind you, one of the things that the Bible does say 
is that some people can, are concerned about this because it seems to give women a lesser role. The Bible does say that the, the one that is greatest in the kingdom of God is the one who serves others. And so if you feel like that letting men make the deciding role as opposed to men loving their wives so much that their wives understand they would die for them, which seems to be a really good balance. But if you feel like you might have gotten a little bit less, let me remind you that in serving, you become like Christ and you're the greatest in the kingdom of God. So if a man thinks that he's the greatest because he gets to make those decisions for the family, when it can't be worked together and arranged... He needs to do two things. Number one, he needs to make a decision based on the fact that he loves his wife and wants her, uh, wants her best and wants her to feel loved and secure. And number two, by letting him make that decision, she becomes more like Jesus. So he better be careful how he deals with that, uh, with that privilege. Okay, great. All right, next question. In your opinion, what is the best cut of steak? I really like sirloins, but my favorite cut of steak is ribeye. Now, the problem with the ribeye, I, I do like bone-in pieces. I do like, uh, I do like a bone-in ribeye. I like a, a steak Fiorentino or a Cote de Boeuf, uh, a, a porterhouse steak. But if I'm just taking r regular cuts, I go for the ribeye. All that fat in there means you end up having to cut a lot of it out. But man, does it really taste good. So I go with ribeye. Okay, does God really care if I get married or not? You know... Uh, this may shock you, but God doesn't care about that as much as you think he does. What he really cares about is that you should be like Jesus. And you can learn. Now, there are obviously some, uh, some thoughts uh, one way or the other. Uh, the Apostle Paul has some really good things to say in 1 Corinthians about being married or not being married. And, and it's really, really clear that to be married or to not be married is a gift either direction. To be married is a gift from God and to be single is a gift from God. And by gift, I mean a, a, a wonderful expression of a way to choose a life, but not everybody has that capability. But it is really important for us to understand that the product of marriage needs to not exist to make us, Rick Warren, I think, says it, it's not, marriage doesn't exist to make us happy, it, it exists to make us holy. And so what God doesn't, really think marriage is as important as the world tends to think it is. And that's why I think we have that problem in the church where people who are single and seem to be, singleness seems to be working for them. People act like, oh, that's terrible that they're single. I have a really good friend, Dwight Palmquist. They just laid his ashes to, to, to rest in uh, Lanao in the Philippines. And he served his entire life in the Philippines single. And the reason was he felt called to go to every, every remote village, every remote barangay and preach the gospel. And he said, it wouldn't be a good a life for a wife and it wouldn't be a good way to raise kids. And he felt God's calling was more important to him. I respect him tremendously. Did he want to be married? Yeah. Dwight and I were single in the same time in the Philippines. We hung out a lot. We talked about it a lot. He wanted to be married, but he was more willing to sacrifice what he wanted for what the Lord wanted. So... Yeah, people around you care. I don't think God cares as much as we would think he would. Okay. How are you able to balance self-needs, family need, and congregational needs in my life? I, that's a good question. Sounds like somebody in ministry asked that question. All right. I, I mean this in a nice way, and I, and I think my wife and my daughter can echo this. Our family is, is built around fulfilling God's plan and purpose for our lives. And we believe that God's plan and purpose for our lives at this particular time is to be serving IES as a family. And my, wife's, my wife is not an employed pastor of the church, but she's very, very much involved in the church. My daughter was always very much involved in the church, and I'm very much involved in the church. And so we try to set priorities in our family relationships and all those other kinds of things. Uh, but our, we, our understanding is that it comes out of serving the church that we actually find the greatest joy. Um, you know, I, I've never been the kind of guy who felt guilty if I took some time to watch TV or took some time to relax or took a vacation because we're committed to what we're doing in the church. And so there's no conflict to me. So I've never actually really had a problem with that. So that's good. It's not a problem to balance to me. They're all on the same thing. All right. Uh, if someone has a prayer request, is there a difference if I pray behind closed doors, fast, slow, bowing, kneeling, as long as I'm fully committed? 
Yeah, any way you pray most effectively for you is great. And God doesn't answer or not answer the prayer request based on those kinds of things. Now, you know, sometimes we'll do some things, like I'm getting ready to do a series on the Lord's Prayer, the first couple of weekends of, of September. I'm really excited about the series. And one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together, and, and I'm going to invite everybody to raise their hands when they pray. And it's a posture of prayer that we see in the Old Testament and during the time of Jesus. It's not that it makes it more effective, but I think it helps us to have understanding. So, any way that you can pray and any way that helps you pray is great. When you retire from IES, how will the church choose a new pastor? When you retire, no, that, I know you mean me. Okay, so there is a process that's been set up by the deacons. There is a succession plan. Uh, the deacons have done a lot of research, read a lot of material, uh, talked to a lot of other kinds of circumstantial things within NGOs and things like that. And then uh, there's been a lot of thought and prayer into it. And there is a succession plan in place that I think is really, really good. And so that's going to be unfolding over the next few years. And the goal is to have a new pastor in place in IES uh, working with me to a larger and larger and larger degree. And I will be becoming... Uh, uh, turning over things bit by bit by bit over towards the end. And I think it's a really good plan. So uh, the plan is a little bit complicated. Uh, uh, I don't want to just spell it all out here. But if you are a part of IES, you can go to one of the deacons or you can approach me and ask, and I will be happy to explain the whole thing to you. So great question. How can I be a, a member of IES? What does it mean to be a voting member? Is it about tithing and how much I give? Okay, this is how it works. Everybody who goes to IES, we use the word member for them. Even the first time you're there, you're a member. Because we want you to understand that you're a part and you can participate in almost every way. But in a church or any organization, you have to identify those who are involved in the uh, decision-making uh, system. So who gets to have a say in, in what it is? In IES, it's the voting members. In order to be a voting member, you need to attend a seminar in which you hear about all the things in IES, you understand the history of IES, you commit yourself to certain kinds of things. You know, one of the things that would be really bad or uh, it would be so wrong for the church would be for people to join the church and they become members and voting members and they don't know what the church stands for and then they try and change everything. They might come in and say, oh, I want to change the governance of the church or I want to change this or that. You go through the process, you commit yourself to what we're already doing and then you become a voting member. Now, the voting member is not about uh, anything else other than you want to commit yourself to the decision-making process. However, there are, there are two issues involved. Number one, you need to attend the church a certain number of times. And during this time and this season, we're sorting out uh, online attendance also counts, obviously. So we're sorting out how that's going to be done, and, and we're waiting about a year or so to see everything. And then the second thing is about giving. Look, we're not after anybody's money. But there's something that should be really obvious. If you want to be a voting member of the church, one of the things that happens is you get the financial reports and then you are eligible to be a deacon and you vote on the deacons and the deacons make financial decisions of the church. It would be hypocritical if you were a voting member of the church and making financial decisions for the church and you weren't participating in the finances of the church. That would be enormously hypocritical. You wouldn't want that. So those people who are voting members commit themselves to give to the church, to support the church, and to give to the church as the Lord leads them. We're not, uh, we're not talking percentages. We're talking listening to the voice of the Lord. Okay, next question. Is it possible that aliens in the multiverse exist? Yeah, of course it's possible. Uh, aliens would be uh, intelligent life elsewhere outside of the earth. Sometimes I'm more worried about is there any intelligent life on earth at all? Uh, you know, I've been engaged in different times in my life and discussions about the intelligence of certain kinds of animals in the world and, and how high that intelligence can be. Some of the great primates, certainly there's a lot of discussion about dolphins and things like that. The multiverse question is really, really interesting. I don't understand all of the physics involved in the multiverse, but I believe that it is not only uh, something that is 
uh, sustainable or something that's understandable. I believe that uh, in one sense, Scripture points us kind of in that direction in this way, okay? So I'm not suggesting there are all these parallel worlds that are only slightly different, like there's another world where there's an IES and there's a Pastor Dave, but he's not as good looking as me or something like that. But, but um, what it really is is something like this. In the Old Testament, when God would speak to a prophet and the prophet would speak to the people that he's speaking to, more often than not, the prophet would say, if you do this, this will happen. And if you do this, this will happen. And if you do this, this will happen. And that means that God not only knows what's going to happen, but God knows what would have happened if other things had been done, which sounds an awful lot like a multiverse to me. And, and so we, we say God is outside of time, yes, but he's outside of our burrowing through time as well. If whatever decisions you make that might open up all these endless possibilities, God knows what would have happened in every single one of them. Is that a multiverse? It's better than a multiverse. Uh, anyway, let's go on to the next question. Is it contradictory for Christians to have compassion for those who overtly reject God's way? Not at all. What you've got to remember is God loves all of the people of the world. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that I, that I don't fit in or I don't agree with some of the things that people say about predestination and stuff like that. Um, there are people who believe in those kind of things and say God doesn't love those people or God didn't send his son Jesus for those people. And uh, I, I find that uh, a very difficult to receive. Uh, and I know that the theologians that favor those things, they have answers to that. And that's great. I'm glad they do. But I don't necessarily accept their answer. God loves every human being. In every human being, there is the image of God created into that person. And so if he loves them, we need to love them. We say, well, would God love somebody who, like, betrayed Jesus? Well, yeah, uh, Simon Peter betrayed Jesus three times, and God not only loved him, he forgave him. And, and you and I have betrayed Jesus before, and he loves us and forgives us. So does God love them? Yes. So I need to love them as well. And, and, and I think that's the thing we should do. Okay. Oh, what is the white relationship between a man and his wife and his parents? Well, the Bible's pretty clear on that. Really early on in the Bible, it says... A man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and the two will become one. And you got to remember that's a patriarchal society in the Old Testament. And so it was understood that the girl sort of left her family and became a part of his family. And what the Bible is saying, what God is saying in that sense is, yes, the girl leaves her family and becomes a part of his family, but he changes and sets priorities and he he makes his wife the first priority. Now, does that mean you, you're fomenting open rebellion against the parents or anything that, like that? Of course not. You need to respect and care for and be involved in society in a way that's proper. But if a man is married to a woman, he needs to be able to make her first in, in, in his life, and, and that's really important. What are your views about mental health in relation to violence in the family, kids, teens, young adults, and people in general? Um, I, I think the mental health issues are really important important issues. I think as Christians, we need to understand that the, the life that we live in Jesus, uh, by, by we transform our lives, we transform our minds by submitting to Christ and we bring ourselves into a place of mental health. Um, I believe in physical healing, which is sometimes required for that. I believe people who have mental health struggles that are biologically related should get help from medical personnel where possible. And I think we need to be sensitive and be careful in helping people. Uh, you know, there, there's like, like some people are discouraged. And when people are discouraged, we can encourage them and pick them up. But some people suffer from clinical depression. And uh, the clinical depression seems to be biological and chemical. And certain chemicals can really help them. And that's a good thing. You know, because of my family history and, and because of some other things, I have a tendency towards... Um, issues with how blood, how my blood, my body handles sugar. It's not because I'm not spiritual enough or I, you know, want to do this or want to do that. It's just what happens in my body. And so I, I use some medical things to help me with those things. It doesn't mean I don't have faith and it should be understood in the same way for those people struggling with mental health. Good counseling, 
submission to God's will, prayer, those kind of things are important. Physical help is also important. We, we need to look to helping people who struggle with those things. Okay. Pastor Dave, what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? Do you mean a, a European or an African swallow? That depends. The answer depends on that. All right. Uh, Pastor Dave, when pastors are together, what do they like to talk about? Yeah, it really depends. Pastors pretty much talk about the same kind of thing. So usually we talk about what's going on in our churches. Uh, we talk about what our plans are for the future. We talk about what's happening. For pastors who are more interested in, say, governance and issues like that, we talk about how those kinds of things are going on. We talk about what's exciting. We talk about what's challenging. Uh, we talk about our families, uh, pretty much the same thing as everybody else. We talk about what good movies are coming out. We talk about great restaurants to eat in. And we talk about where do you find a really good taco in Jakarta. Those are the things that pastors talk about. All right. Is it right for a Christian to date or marry a non-Christian? Uh, this is a really good question. So let me kind of start and go back and just say, I'm going to start from the ending, and I'm going to say that if you're married to a person who's not a Christian and you married to them because you chose them even when they weren't a Christian, you're setting up your marriage for a lot of real difficulties. Um, and, and so I really strongly encourage, and the Bible actually talks about Christians should choose to marry Christians. It talks about that. I think it's in 1 Corinthians, right around 1 Corinthians 7, 8, 9 in that area, there's some teaching about marriage. And, uh, and when a Christian has an opportunity to be married to a Christian, they should take that opportunity. Now, the question is, is it okay to date a non-Christian? Well, it depends on your understanding and purpose of dating. You know, dating is completely different in many, many, most places. Uh, I know for a lot of people in America, dating is just a, a social interaction. You're, you know, you're not necessarily finding a person or you're not necessarily identifying people that you're dating as a person that you want to marry. Um, I always encourage people to not date anybody they wouldn't marry because I think once you start down that direction, things get really, really complicated. And I've known people who would say, well, I'll date this person, but I'll never marry them because they're not a follower of Jesus. And then it gets really complicated when they fall in love and, and they may find out the person is a really nice person. There are a lot of really nice non-Christians out there. And, um, and so, you know, that gets really, really complicated. So I would say on the dating side, it's okay, but make sure you have a line drawn in your heart at what point your commitment to that person is prepared to be much more serious feelings. And don't go there if they're not a Christian, because you're going to help yourself from potentially uh, being in a place where you're hurt. You know, I, I know people who have married non-believers, and I know some where it's worked out really well, and the non-believer became a believer and all that, and I understand that, and that's, I'm always thankful for those things, but we don't practice, uh, we don't practice relational or dating evangelism. Uh, we need to, we need to commit ourselves to a person that shares our same faith with us. Next question. If God is sovereign and has ordained all things, why should I attempt to stop someone from committing suicide? If God is sovereign and has ordained all things, why do I need a menu when I go to a restaurant? I should just sit down and say, just give me the food that God has ordained for me. Um, committing suicide is a terrible thing. It's, it's terrible for the person who commits suicide because they're really struggling with difficult things. And it's so hard on the people who are left behind. And so we should always do whatever we can to help people who find themselves in a situation who they're contemplating suicide. As Christians, we should make sure that they understand that first of all, uh, they will really hurt the people that they love. And even if there's nobody that they love, they will hurt a lot of people who love them. And secondly, when you commit suicide, you're saying that you're not willing to wait for God's solution to the issues in your life, and you're not willing to trust God to bring you through. There are really, really tough situations in life, and I don't want to belittle anyone who's thinking about taking their own life. But if you're there and you're thinking about, seriously thinking about taking your own life, get in touch with me because I'd like to pray for you and I'd like to help you. God has a plan and purpose for your life, and you don't want to end your life on your own. You want to fulfill what it is that he has for you. 
Every different service, they're talking about services in IES Saturday and Sunday. Every service has a different personality. If you did not go to all services, uh, which one would you choose? Okay, so I'm joining IES. I'm not a pastor. I'm not in anything like that. And I'm trying to figure out which service I want to go to. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find out where does this church need my skills. I don't want to just be a sitter. I want to be a participant. Uh, I, I want to have a purpose. You know, the Bible says that whenever they gather together, each one has a purpose. Each one does something. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to say, "Oh, I'm going to pick the service that I like best." I'm going to ask the question, "Where do they need me the most?" And then I'm going to be there helping in that service, and then I'm going to attend another service. So, if they would say to me, uh, "We really need volunteers on Saturday night because we need gatekeepers and people to work in the kids ministry," and I would say, "All right, on Saturday I'm going to be there and serve the kids." And then I'd say, well, which are the two Sunday services? And I'd see if there's anything else I can do. And then I, I, I would probably pick the second service because I like a bigger crowd. The 1115 has a bigger crowd. It's kind of more fun to sing together with a bigger crowd. Uh, I promise you, they're not going to ask me to be involved in 115. If you've ever been next to me during worship, you know that my voice is only intended for the angels, not for the public, you know. And, and then I would attend one service and I would serve in the other services. Maybe I could be involved in the, in the greeting or something like that. And, and then I would go. Uh, I know the different services have different personality and they're all, they're all special to me, but uh, I'm going to go where I can serve. That's, that's what's more important about to me. That's what I would do. All right. And the next question fits in really well. How do I volunteer? Well, what you need to do is, is you find out what you want to volunteer in, what your skills and abilities are. Uh, you can send me a letter. Let me know that. My email address is dave at org, And then I'll put you in touch with the people that can be involved. If you have some ideas about volunteering and maybe we're not doing the kind of things you want to volunteer, in, we, we could start some new ministries also. So get in touch with me and I will put you in touch with the people. We really need helpers with the kids. Uh, our kids ministry is just blowing up again. And we need some more people. You can be a gatekeeper, which just means that you help the kids check in and uh, you make sure that the kids get sent by the right parents and things like that. Or you can use your talents and abilities to teach the kids. It's not hard. We have really good kids. We have really smart kids. And you'll be surprised how fascinating it is to teach them. Uh, what do you think about pastors dating? Is it more complicated? Well, I, I date. I, Monday, I took my wife on a date. Uh, so I don't see. No, I, I know you're talking about single pastors. Yeah, it is, it is more complicated be, because there's some other kinds of expectations that go with the role of a pastor. You got to remember, I, I, was, uh, I was single until I got married. I hope you caught that. But I was in ministry for quite a while before I got married. And so I was a single pastor. And uh, uh, when you date somebody, when you're a pastor, uh, you have a lot more people asking questions and observing and things like that. And of course, if you're called into ministry, uh, and you feel that your calling is pretty clear, then you also need to see uh, how the person that you're dating, whether they fit into it. Like, for instance, if you're called into ministry, you, you, you can only date Christians. I mean, that should be really painfully obvious. Um, I will say this, and I, and, I, and I say it as graciously as I can. Uh, when I met, I, when I fell in love with my wife, I met my wife and and, uh, you know, prior to that, every relationship I had been in, I, I tried to figure out how it would fit into my call in the ministry. And when I met my wife, one of the things that really attracted me about her was that she was already in ministry, had nothing to do with me. She had given up her career to serve the Lord. And then beyond that, I didn't, I didn't care how... I didn't care how it fitted. I wanted to be married to her. And I think for those of you who are asking a question about marriage, that's one of the most important questions is, are you just picking somebody or is this the person you want to spend your life with? And I wanted to spend my life with her in ministry, but uh, it was really important to me. All right, let's go on to the next question. Should we worry when we see the prevalence of instability in global systems and national governments? Why or why not? Our faith is in the Lord. However, of course, we need to be worried. Whatever country we're citizens of, we need to exercise our rights as citizens to do what's very best for our country. Wars and issues that happen in the world cause an enormous amount of suffering. Um, what's happening in, in, in this, this war in Europe, people are dying, people are suffering, people are being separated, children are being terrorized. All of these things are happening. And so we need to understand that as Christians, we need to engage in the world system. We're not afraid of what's going to happen, 
but we need to engage in the very best way that we can in helping people in these difficult times. Are we worried about them? No, we're not worried about them. We know that God is in control, but we also believe that he has a role and function for us to play in the things that are going on around us. Great question. Thank you very much. Pastor Dave, what are your thoughts on firearms being violated in the U.S.? It seems to be worse day by day, whether on the streets, shops, neighborhoods, and schools. Yeah, there's a lot of great ironies. First of all, the firearm issue in America is extremely complex, and I'm not going to begin to try and prescribe one solution because there is no one solution. There are a lot of different solutions. You've got firearm violence that is like gang violence, people violently using firearms. You've got firearm accidents. You've got firearms as a method of suicide, and you've got a bunch of other things in between. And there are solutions to all of those things. And uh, sometime, if you want, we can sit down together and have a cup of coffee, and I can give you my opinions. But it's a little bit long and complicated for this. Uh, I'm an American citizen. I have opinions about those things, and I'm happy to express them. So uh, next question. Who is your favorite theologian and why? All right, so the word theologian is probably not the, way, the approach that I would take. Uh, to that question. There are a number of theologians. I'm, I'm not really a fan of theologians. I'm more a fan of Bible scholars. Currently, my favorite Bible scholar would be uh, a guy named N.T. Wright. And uh, uh, I really enjoy a lot of things about N.T. Wright. Um, I, I have uh, read a number of the things that he's written. And uh, I think he has done really, really, really well on a historical, cultural understanding of some of the things that are said in the Bible. And I really appreciate his attitude. He's a, he's a very uh, soft-spoken man. He's a very gentle man. And, uh, and also, he's quite funny. So I appreciate that about him. Uh, my favorite Bible scholar absolutely would have to be Gordon Fee. Uh, Gordon was a wonderful man, uh, is still a wonderful man. Uh, he's uh, suffering in sickness now, but uh, he really had a big impact in my life. Uh, a book that he wrote called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth changed the way I read and understood the Bible. And uh, he was a great preacher. He was a very much a Pentecostal preacher, very much believed in an active power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, as a Bible scholar, the way you look and understand Bible influences your theolo theological understanding of God. But I prefer to look to Bible scholars for those things. Uh, C.S. Lewis, who of course was, was actually an academic in uh, literature, uh, also has a lot of things that, that influenced me. So I would say, yeah, Gordon Fee for sure, and then N.T. Wright, and then C.S. Lewis, and a number of other great, great Bible scholars, but those would be the ones I'm most familiar with. How do you design and hold meetings for the staff? You know, I think that there's, uh, there's a framework that we do with the staff in which we do the same kind of things consistently. And these things are things that we change in different ways at different times. Uh, one time in the staff, we, we uh, began our time with uh, certain forms of prayer, and now uh, we, we give opportunities for all the people who are in the staff to participate in planning the staff. We do soap as a staff because there's a soap reading that's done in the church, and so we as a staff read it and we interact on it in different ways. Uh, in person is different from when we do it on Zoom. Right now we have kind of an interesting hybrid effect because we have staff members who are participating from other places, sometimes if they're sick. And of course we have some staff on, on Bali, so they participate in, in kind of a hybrid session. Uh, and so that's more or less what we do. Is there beyond prayer a way to overcome self-centeredness? Prayer is a really way, good way to do that. And you don't pray to stop being self-centered. You start praying for other people. Um, if you pray that you won't be self-centered, you're still centering on yourself. Uh, the other thing to do would be to consistently do things to, to help other people, to reach out to other people, to encourage people. And as you do those, you'll start seeing uh, more and more of these situations in their life and less and less the situations in your own. Good question. I pray the Lord will help you to stop being self-centered. Okay, here we go. Is it wrong not to give money to beggars in the street if they don't look needy but lazy and still instead? Um, I think the, the goal of beggars is to look lazy. Look, uh, dealing with beggars is a really complex topic. I think that um, uh, I know we all know that there are many of them who are professional beggars. And, you know, when my wife and I, well, we lived in Mentang for three years, and there was one spot, and for 18 months, there was a lady who was there begging with about a three-month-old baby. 
And she was there for 18 months and the baby never got older. She was swapping babies in and out, you know. And so I know there's a lot of fraud in begging and stuff like that. But I find that my rule of thumb is if I feel like I should give something to help them, I do it. And I don't worry about what they do with it. Now, I would prefer to do something more concrete, like give them a job or a home or something like that. But that's not always possible. Uh, the first, this is an interesting question. Are Roman Catholics Christian? So basically, the answer is yes. And basically, the Christian church is divided into three major streams. One is Roman Catholicism. One is Eastern Orthodox. Uh, it's, it's Eastern Orthodox because at a, a long time ago, there was a separation between the church that was centered around Rome and the churches that were centered around Constantinople. And then there, there is another uh, string, of course, who are called Protestants. And all of these are Christians. And interestingly enough, all of them believe a lot of things in common. They're not as different as you would think. Uh, there's a lot of commonality between them and things like that. So very, very, very definitely Roman Catholics are Christian. I'm confused with different denominations. Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Protestant, Evangelical, Anglican, Pentecostal. What's the difference? Well, there are important differences. And uh, it's, a person needs to see these things and a person needs to understand the differences and then align themselves with the particular church that uh, their, their perspective on certain kinds of things uh, lines up with their own personal perspective. So, for instance, I, I consider myself a classic Pentecostal. I, call, I use the word classic Pentecostal because I, I, I fit in experientially and uh, theologically with the Pentecostal movement that came out about uh, 110 years ago and uh, simultaneously in North America and in India and places in Europe and, and the Nordic countries and things like that uh, th that I know of. And uh, we view certain things in certain ways. Now, uh, I do believe that the thing that makes me a Pentecostal is that I believe that it is my hermeneutic. In other words, what I see re happening in the early church is what I believe should be happening. And so when I say that I'm Pentecostal, it means I believe that the Holy Spirit is given, that the church would do certain things. And that's why I'm Pentecostal. But there are other people that feel other things are equally or more important for them. And, and, and that's fine. It's really good for us to be able to understand how God works in a way that works well with us, in a way that is accurate in terms of what we see, and the role of the church, the role of Scripture, the role of the Holy Spirit. And it's good for people to combine themselves with people who feel the same way. It'd be terrible if we lived in a world where there was only one kind of fast food. And it would be terrible if we lived in a kind of world where there was only one kind of worship, way to worship God or one kind of church governance or all of those different things. So uh, that's why there are different denominations. It is a good thing. All right. What's on your heart and mind for IES Next Mission? How can IES reach out to more in the next few years, especially before you retire? Well, right now, I think the, one of the things that's really important is that we're building stability in our new place. You know, uh, the two years of COVID impacted a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And we don't really know yet what the next few years is going to look like. Uh, it seems like right now that we're seeing COVID kind of dwindling and people getting COVID, but they're not as, as ill, though it, it really, there are still people dying. We don't know if that's going to continue. Are we going to continue seeing waves of different things? Uh, I think we've clearly understood that being a part of an online church is, a, is also a positive and valuable experience. So we're going to see uh, IES as a church being a church that meets in person or online. But I think that one of the things I'd like to see is, is um, I would like to help as long as we're in Indonesia, I would like to see uh, churches being planted in Indonesia. Now, in the past, we've helped to plant churches that are international churches like IES. And we're thankful for all of those. And I think we'd also like to be engaged in helping to plant uh, some Bahasa Indonesia speaking churches uh, as a part of the Gay SJI. Um, do we want to continue to see people being moved into leadership roles, be, being trained? We want to see families being ministered to. Uh, I love to go and see what's going on with the teens and, and the children. I'm not looking for a different kind of season. I want to serve God for the time until I retire and, and have the church move forward and have it move forward to new leadership. Let's go to the Lord together, and I want to pray a prayer of benediction over you. Now, uh, because we are, we are uh, 
participating in, in honoring Indonesia and rejoicing with Indonesia for the 17 Agustus, the Independence Day. There will be a prayer specifically for Indonesia after this and then a benediction song. But let's do a benediction over this Q&A. Father, I just lift up to you every single person who's been watching this. I pray that your hand would be upon them. I pray that you would watch over them. And I pray, Lord, that the things that they've heard, uh, the questions that have been asked, the answers that have been given, that these things would fit together in their heart and that you would draw them close. Our goal is not to gain knowledge. Our goal is to become more and more like Jesus. Now, my brothers and my sisters, I pray that the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit would be with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come and let's pray for our beloved Indonesia. Father, I, I pray for this country, Lord, and I pray for peace and safety, Lord. When the world, there's so much going on, Lord, we ask for your peace and safety to reign in this country, Lord, and especially also that there is an election uh, coming up soon, Lord, and I pray that you'll help, Lord, because you are the Prince of Peace, and we ask for your peace to reign in this country. Lord, I pray for the people who are so affected, Lord, from the COVID and how in the last two years they, they are left behind, whether in, in their uh, pocketbooks, economically, in their business, Lord, or whether it's in their education that they're left behind. Lord, I pray for the people of Indonesia, Lord, that they can catch up, that you will sustain them and that you will provide for them, Lord, and help them, Lord, to be able to sustain themselves, Lord, and to thrive, Lord, in this very challenging times. Lord, I pray for the safety, Lord, of, of this uh, nation, Lord, the, the 17,000 islands that, that are often um, shaken with earthquakes and, and uh, tsunamis, Lord, and I pray for the safety that you will just keep the country and the people safe, Lord, from all these natural disasters, Lord. Lord, I also pray, Lord, that you will bless this land, that it will be fertile, that it will be sufficient, Lord, to, to feed uh, for the people of Indonesia. Lord, I also pray for the people who hold government offices, Lord, that you will give them the wisdom, Lord, to, and whatever they do, Lord, they will do for the good of the people of the land, for the people of Indonesia. And Lord, whenever there are those who want to abuse their uh, position for power and their own gain, I pray that you make their plans fail. And I know from time to time there are people who want to divide the country, Lord, and I pray that their plans will fail. Lord, and I pray for the good guys, Lord, the ones who honestly want to bring the good and to benefit the country, Lord. I pray that you will bring success to their offices. You bring success to their work, Lord. I pray for the president, for the cabinet ministers, Lord, and for everyone who is in place of power, Lord, who is managing the entire country, that you will give them the wisdom, Lord, and the ability, Lord, to have foresight so that they can help the country to continue to grow and prosper, Lord. Lord, I pray also, not only for stability, but for, for truth, for your truth, for the hope that is in Christ Jesus to spread all ac across Indonesia that every tribe in this country will come to know you and will be saved by the saving knowledge, by, by your blood, Jesus. And I pray for the churches everywhere in this nation that they will thrive and they will be the source of your light. Lord, Lastly, we just want to thank you, Lord, for everything, Lord. In every way that you have blessed this country, we want to give you thanks. And for the peace that we have enjoyed, Lord, we want to give you thanks, Lord, for everything that you have done. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. What could I remember? What could and bagian ku selamanya? 
happen when we pray, especially when we add fasting to it. And as we continue our quarterly fast on August 17, 18, and the 19th, we're going to do it differently because now we have a new facility and we're so grateful to the Lord for what He has provided. And I'm sure you have things in your life that you're grateful for. So we encourage you to register at isjack.art. That way we know how many people will come in person on Friday. Uh, August 19th at 7 p.m. when we break the fast in person and also that way we get to be able to send you the prayer points and the Bible verses. God bless you as we fast together.